The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot to the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah wrote those words prophesying about the coming Messiah, about who Jesus was, and what he was like. Of course, the people of Isaiah's time didn't understand him. He didn't understand about Messiah. And then when Jesus was born, well, the people then didn't understand either. You see, they were surprised by the Messiah that God sent them because he wasn't the Messiah that they wanted. Today, as we kick off our Christmas series called Christmas Surprise, we're looking at Isaiah's prophecy to discover the Savior that God sent us. Because he may not be the Messiah that you want or were expecting. I'd invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible app and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 is our text for today. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 680 and you will find Isaiah chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read the Bible, then please take one of these. It's our gift to you. Call it a Christmas present. We're okay with that. Uh, And uh, we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So Isaiah is telling the people about Messiah. He's telling them about Jesus, even though uh, he didn't uh, ever get to see Jesus in the flesh. It was 700 years before that. He begins by telling us that Jesus is light. Jesus is light. Uh, Verse 2, as it kicked off, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Uh, light changes everything, right? Light changes everything. It allows us to see, to move, to live. Have you ever tried to navigate your house in the darkness? Have you, have you done this? And, and like, because you know where all the furniture is, you know where everything is, and so you don't turn the light on, and, and then what do you do? Yeah, you, you walk into something, right? You kick something, you know, it, it was always there, it wasn't there, you left it there, whatever, and suddenly you're speaking in a new language, Right? I'm sorry. If you do it loud enough, your spouse comes running to see if you're having a seizure uh, or just to laugh uh, because you didn't turn the light on. Light changes everything. And, and here's the reality. Without Jesus, we live in darkness. Jesus is the light. Scripture proclaims it over and over and over again. Uh, the Gospel of John the, the very beginning, the apostle writes, in the beginning was the Word. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the eternal Word, the logos of God, the rationale. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that has been made. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness could not even comprehend it. Could not overcome it. And then, of course, Jesus told us, his followers, that we are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
The Apostle Paul said that we are people of the light. We used to be people of the darkness, but now we're people of the light. So walk in the light. You see, here at Calvary, we talk about life change a lot. It's our mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So we're all about life change. Uh, and, and that's because when a person decides to follow Jesus, it's like a light comes on for them. Everything changes because God the Holy Spirit moves into your life and he drives the darkness away. The Holy Spirit drives the darkness away. Now, uh, we're sinners, and so we're still drawn to the light. In fact, Jesus actually said, uh, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so there's that, that part of us that craves the darkness. And, and so we lean back into it. But whenever we submit to God, whenever we submit to the Holy Spirit, then he drives the darkness out of our lives. Uh, we can't defeat darkness by ourselves. But with the light of Jesus in you, all the darkness that exists cannot extinguish the light. So has Jesus surprised you with his light? Has it come on in your soul? Do you know Jesus is light? Isaiah begins by telling us that the Messiah, that Jesus is light, and then he tells us that Jesus is leader. Jesus is leader. Look down at verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, I grew up in church, so I grew up hearing this verse, uh, these passages, uh, really every year at Christmas. And, and we would read them, and they would sing songs based on them, and, and some of you are hearing the songs in your head right now. And, and, and that's okay. But, but here's the thing. I never liked that phrase, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Can I, can I just be honest? When I was little, I didn't understand it. When I got older, I just didn't like it because, honestly, I don't like government. Okay? I mean, you know, it doesn't have a positive connotation. Because when I think about government in our culture, in our context, I think about bureaucracy. I think about inefficiency. I think about corruption or abuse of power. I know lots of people who work for the government. I love them, but I just don't like the idea of government. And Isaiah equates Jesus with government. And I was like, what is he trying to say? And, and here's the thing. Isaiah is speaking into his culture, and we're living in our culture. In Isaiah's culture, the government is wrapped up in one person, the king. He's the leader. He's the king. He's the one who's in charge, and the nation rises and falls on that one person. The government's on his shoulder. It's all on him. We saw last week how David's sin impacted an entire nation. And so then we go, oh, so Isaiah is talking about Jesus as a leader because he's the king. So then we have to go back to our culture because our culture impacts us because we're raised in a democracy and we think that we should vote for everything, right? We don't you want to have a say in stuff? You go, who made that decision? I didn't get a vote. And we vote for our president. And Isaiah is looking at this and saying, I submit to my king. And even if you vote for your president and he wins, you don't necessarily like all his policies. You're like, well, I don't like that one. I like this one, but I don't like that. And, and Isaiah, he doesn't have that, that struggle because if he embraces his king, if he is, submits to his king, then he embraces the king's values and the king's character and everything that the king stands for. So when we read this, we see that he's saying Jesus is your leader. See, honestly, Jesus doesn't want to be your president. He wants to be your king. He wants to be your leader. What, what was Jesus' most common invitation to people as he walked the countryside of Galilee and Judea? It was, follow me. Follow me. Follow me and I'll lead you to truth, to life, to restoration, to healing and hope. If you follow Jesus, he will surprise you. So all of us in this room are in one of three categories, and I want to share those categories with you and, and invite you to kind of have a conversation with God about where you fit in that, in, in, in all those categories. So uh, the first one is some of you in this room are not yet followers of Jesus. I mean, you're here, you came with friends or family, or maybe you just thought, I'm going to check it out and see what I think. But you've never really said yes to Jesus. You've never acknowledged him as Lord of your life and said, you're my king and I submit to you. And today, I want you to know that Jesus is still saying to you, follow me. 
follow me. Let me surprise you with life. Let me change your life. And then the second category is uh, some of you are uh, rebellious followers of Jesus. You know, you, you believe that Jesus is Lord, and, and, and you know your sins are forgiven, and you know that heaven is your home, and you've declared your allegiance to Jesus, but right now you're not really trying to do what he wants you to do. I mean, you know, you know what he wants you to do, but you're kind of saying things like, I know I should, but, or uh, I, I know this isn't right, but, and, and you're living in rebellion, and, and you know that but you haven't decided to change it yet. And today I want you to know that Jesus is saying to you, follow me again. Let me heal you. Let me forgive you. Let me restore you. Let me bless you. Because right now you're, you're reaping the results of your life of rebellion and it's not pretty. And then some of you are in the category of active follower. You're not perfect. You, you know, you're not flawless, but the cry of your heart is to follow Jesus. And today, I hope you hear Jesus saying, keep it up. Don't give up. Follow me. So today, is, is Jesus your leader? Are you following him? So Isaiah tells us that Jesus is light and Jesus is leader, and he tells us that Jesus is counselor. Continue in verse 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. You know, I've noticed that a lot of Christians love to quote Proverbs chapter 3. It's one of the most quoted uh, verses in the Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I love it. People are quoting it with me. You guys know it. See, we love it. We love to write it on graduation cards or encourage people with those words. They're great words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But are we listening to Jesus as our counselor? Are we hearing the wise counsel that Jesus is offering us? Jesus kind of asked the same question in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount at the very end. He says this, and this applies to everybody who's hearing what Jesus is teaching. He says, the one who hears my words and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rains come down, the floodwaters rise, and yet the house stands firm because it has its foundation on the rock. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the floodwaters rose, and the house fell, and great was its crash. Are we listening to the counsel of Jesus? Because he's offering us wise counsel. But a counselor doesn't just offer wise counsel. He also helps you to see yourself, to become aware of who you are. That's why when you begin following Jesus, there's conviction. Because the closer you get to him, he's light. his light shines in your life. And we become painfully aware of the sin and the failure and the flaws in our lives. So it drives us to repentance. That's why we, we, we come to Jesus and we say, I'm sorry and I've sinned and please forgive me because we understand that. It becomes perfectly clear. So we become aware of that, but we also become aware of our value in God's eyes. We become aware that God created us and he loves us and he values us enough that he sent Jesus to suffer and die on the cross for our sins so that we could be redeemed and be included in his family. So do you see your flaws and your failures so that you can repent? Do you see your eternal value to God so that you can rejoice? Because it's both and. Uh, some of us get stuck in just the repentance mode. Some of us in this room ha have a hard time letting go of the fact that, that we've messed up. You know, maybe you're a perfectionist at heart, or maybe you just are going like, I, I can't forgive myself, and so how could God forgive me? And, and so you're, you're always aware of your flaws and your failings and your, your sin, and you come to that place where you're, you're sorry, you're, you're filled with sorrow, and, and you're like pouring out saying, God, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me, but you get stuck right there. And God doesn't want you to get stuck there. See how that godly sorrow leads us to repentance, but the moment that you confess your sins and you say, God, forgive me, the, the grace of God floods into our souls 
telling us that we are cleansed of all of our sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us of all our sin. And so that repentance leads us to a place of rejoicing because we are forgiven and we are included. And God says, I love you and I'm proud of you and I want you to serve me now. And so I've called you to make a difference in this world. We're not supposed to stay in the place of sorrow. It's supposed to lead us to rejoice. Uh, if you're stuck in that place of sorrow and you can't get to the place of rejoicing, we want to help. We want to pray for you and encourage you. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons I love Celebrate Recovery is because it's an intentional journey that, that kind of does self-examination, kind of the mirror of saying, here's who I am, and does it all in the illumination of God's Word. If you're stuck in your journey, if you're, if you're stuck in your habits or your hang-ups, then Monday night at 6.30 at the McCulloch campus, there's a place for you where people can help you learn how to rejoice in what God's doing in your life and how he can set you free. Because Jesus is counselor. Are you listening to him? And then Isaiah tells us that Jesus is God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Mighty God. Now, this is the difficult one for many people to acknowledge and understand because we're talking about the mystery of the incarnation uh, that, as the angel said to Joseph, you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, again, the Apostle John, I'm going to go back to this. These are such powerful words. In the beginning was the word and the the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 of that same chapter, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said this. He said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. In fact, I and the Father are one. This is why Christmas is so incredible and miraculous. The greatest Christmas miracle was not the fact that a virgin had a baby. I mean, that is a pretty cool miracle, right? We sing about it, and it's kind of, celebrate Christmas. You guys know the story. Uh, so uh, that's incredible, but the, the coolest Christmas miracle is that an infinite, almighty God would empty himself and clothe himself in human flesh, frail and weak as a newborn. I mean, if you've held a baby in your arms, you see the miracle that that child represents, but you also know the weakness. God entrusted himself to the care of his creation. How amazing is that? So that he could understand us and redeem us from our sins so that we could be part of his family. That is amazing. That is wonderful. You see, Jesus is God are you worshiping him? Are you worshiping him? Now, that's a weird question to ask. You're in church, right? You've been singing songs. Most of you are listening to the sermon. So, uh, you know, you could say, yeah, we're worshiping him. But I, I understand that things get in the way of worship. And, and I understand how the Christmas season works because I've lived through about 55 of them. And, uh, and, and so uh, I understand that there is a, you know, real strong urge in our lives during the Christmas season to complain right I mean because we were it's Christmas look at the crowds of people they're everywhere I can't get anything in shopping done I gotta go oh, I gotta do shopping I gotta go buy presents for all these people and on the list and I gotta get this done and get that done and all oh, it's so hard and I gotta wrap all these presents and you're no help how come the lights aren't on the house yet oh wait sorry that was a conversation at my house last night uh, so it's not that I don't want to do it but I just don't want to do it and uh, and we got to decorate stuff, and, and then we got, oh, i got to go to the parties. That is such a first world problem. <laughs> right? Too many Christmas parties to go to, that is a first world problem. And by the way, you have my permission to say no. You don't have to go. It's not, you know, like somebody said, you go or you're, you know. And, and, and we got all these, and we start complaining about this stuff. And all, and then the family's coming, and all, oh, the house, we've got to clean the house, we've got to do this, and the family. And you're worried about all the things that are going to happen with the family. Are they there, and who's going to be crazy, and where they going to do what? And we start complaining. And here's the thing. When we're complaining about all this stuff, whether it's little or big, what we're really saying is, God, you're not good enough. 
You're not good enough. You're not, you're not answering my prayers. You're not doing the things I want you to do. You're not fixing stuff like I want it to be fixed. And so you're not good enough. And if you're living in that place where you don't think God is good enough, it's going to be really hard for you to praise him, to celebrate him, to worship him. Because here's what I know. You're either going to complain or you're going to praise because they don't really coexist well. So are you worshiping God because Jesus is God? Are you grateful for his grace and his love that has changed your life? So Isaiah tells us that Jesus is God, and then he tells us that Jesus is Father. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Now, I don't know what kind of a dad you had, whether he was absent or present, whether, you know, he was loving, uh, encouraging, he taught you, protected you, valued you, or not. And if, and if you didn't have that kind of a dad, I'm sorry. But as a follower of Jesus, you have a father who loves you, who forgives you, who values you, who, who wants to bless you, who's waiting for us to come home and be embraced in his grace. And we know this because in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a story. Most of you probably know it. All of you should go home and read Luke 15 again because it's just a great chapter. It's the story of the prodigal son. Here's the story in a nutshell. Jesus says this, this ungrateful brat, well, he was a son, who asked for his inheritance before his dad was dead. That's pretty ungrateful. And his dad was gracious enough to give it to him. He left home, went to a faraway land. He wasted his inheritance on wild living. And then the economy collapsed. Famine hit. And he was broke. And he took the worst job for a good Jewish boy to ever take. He was a pig farmer's assistant. But it gets worse. He was so hungry that he wanted to eat the pig slop. And that's when he came to his senses. And he said... The servants at my father's house have it better than this. I will go home and I will tell my dad, Dad, I've sinned against God and against you and I'm not worthy to be your son and I will be one of your servants. That's repentance, by the way. That's what it looks like. And so he started home, smelling like a pig pen. And his father sees him when he's still a, far, a long way off and he runs to meet him. And, and, the, and the son starts his speech. Dad, I've sinned against God and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. I want you to be your servants. And his dad hugs him, stench and all, and puts a robe on him and puts a ring on his finger. And he says, my son who was lost is now found. Let's throw a party. Let's celebrate the fact that he came home. See, some of you are kind of nervous about coming home. You know, you're just kind of nervous about what God thinks of you right now because you know you've messed up and you know you've wasted a lot of chances and you know that, that you've sinned again and you're really thinking that well, God's probably pretty ticked at me right now. And Jesus told the story of the prodigal son so that we'd understand that when we come home, God's throwing a party. He's excited for you. He loves you. He wants to wrap you up in his embrace. He wants to restore you and, and heal you and tell everybody, hey, they were lost, now they're found. Let's celebrate. Grace is waiting for you if you'll come home. Jesus is for you unapologetically and relentlessly. And, and he's he saying he won't control you, but he will wait for you. And he will look for you. Because he wants you to come home. And Jesus will surprise you if you come home. And then Isaiah tells us that Jesus is peace. Jesus is peace. Verses 6 and 7. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Um, no end to his peace. Uh, we live in a world that doesn't really know peace. I mean, our world is broken, it's violent, it's hate-filled, it's adversarial. And yet, Jesus has the audacity to offer us peace. He offers peace to his followers in the midst of strife and persecution and trials. He, he actually shared these words on the night that he was going to get you know, betrayed and, and crucified. That whole ordeal was starting. He looked at his followers and he said, I told you these things so that in me you will have peace. 
in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. Is that crazy or what? Don't worry about the tribulation. I overcame it. You can have peace even though the world's nuts. So Jesus will give you peace as you trust his word, as you follow his plans, as you place your hope on the promise more than the present. And so we don't have peace because we're afraid. We're afraid because we want to control outcomes and situations and people. Right? You ever lie awake at night going, I wonder how that's going to turn out. I wonder what's going to happen with this situation. I wonder if what's, you know, we're going to, you know, how's this relationship going to go? What's going to happen with this? And we, and we get all worried. We get all anxious about stuff that we can't control. Because you can't control the outcomes. You can't control the situations, and God knows you can't control the people, right? I mean, you would think that marriage would have taught us that. But no, we didn't learn it from marriage, so we had children. And then you would think you would learn that you can't control people, but we're still trying, right? See, we, honestly... The only person I can control is myself, and I struggle to do that well. And Jesus offers us peace if, if we'll just lean into him and we'll go, God, you know what? I, I trust you. You know more than me. You care more than me. And, and these are your people, and, and you're involved in this situation. So I, I'm, I'm going to trust that you're the Prince of Peace. So you give me peace, and I'll let you run the world. Because I can't do it anyway. Uh, that's when we discover the joy of allowing God to lead and to heal and to redeem and to reconcile. So if you want peace in your life, here's a couple of keys that, that really will help. First of all, focus on your character more than outcomes. See, most of us want God to give us outcomes. We want certain outcomes, and we're asking for certain outcomes. And, and God never promises to give us, you know, the specific outcomes in our life the way that we want but here's what I know. If you'll focus on your character rather than trying to control an outcome, God will meet you there. See, again, you can control you. So uh, if you say, okay, I'm going to love because God is love and because he told me to love my neighbor as myself, so I'm going to love people even when they're unlovely. And by the way, love is patient and love is kind. So remember that when you're yelling at your kids. And uh, so I'm going to love, and I'm going to forgive, even if people don't ask for it or they're not worth deserving it because they're never going to deserve it uh, because we don't deserve it, and yet God offers us forgiveness. So I'm going to forgive because that reflects the heart of Jesus, and, and I want to represent Jesus because I can, I can do that. And, and I want to be you know, compassionate, and I want to be kind, and I want to be generous, and I want to I do these things that represent Jesus. And here's what happens. If we focus on our character rather than trying to control the outcomes, God shows up. God shows up in our lives and because he's delighted in us and our character and he starts working miracles that we never imagined. And we have peace while we're doing it because we're being obedient to our God. So try to focus on your character rather than on the outcomes. And, and then focus on the promise more than the present. We get so stressed out because things are not way we want. I mean, sometimes things are really good, and we're like, yay, and then things, sometimes things are really bad, and we're like, oh, this is terrible. And, and if we'll focus on the promise rather than the present, it'll change our attitude and, and give us peace and joy. Because what happens is, the, here, here's the gospel in a nutshell. We all deserved hell, but God sent Jesus to pay for our sins so that we get heaven instead. Isn't that cool? See, and our promise is that, that we get heaven and, and we don't deserve it. And, and that's a reality because of Jesus, not because of us. And we just get to live with that promise in our souls. But a lot of us kind of relegate that promise to like, you know, let's put it in the pantry and up on the top shelf and we'll take it down sometimes occasionally like when somebody dies. But we don't live with that promise. And we focus on the present and we're like, oh, okay, this is so hard and this is so difficult and what am I going to do? And, and God says, hey, live on the promise. Live on the promise because the promise is real and it'll change your life forever and, and let it override the present. That way on the days that it's really good, the promise says, yay, it's going to get better. And on the days that it's really bad, the promise says you can endure this because it's going to get better. 
And then when you, when you really live on that promise, you're going to be, ha- be filled with the joy of Christ because you're going to be living in the reality of the celebration of his victory. See, think about it. We're the people who win. If you're, if you're with Jesus, you win, and nothing can change that. So why in the world are we not living in that joy of the victory celebration now? Just because you can't see it? Well, that's what Scripture's for. You can see it. Because the world can't see it, doesn't matter. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know it to be true. And that will give you peace and allow you to rejoice every single day. Because one day Jesus is going to return and he will establish everlasting peace. And we get to be part of that. You see, this is our Messiah. A gift given to us. Unto us... a child is born unto us a son is given god gave us jesus so i have to ask do you know this jesus have you come to that place in your life where you believe that he is the one and only son of god and savior of the world and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made that commitment to follow jesus with your life if you haven't My prayer is that you would not leave here still living in darkness. Because Jesus is light. And we want his light to flood your life and fill you with hope and give you peace and and give you a purpose in this world. So if you're not sure about this relationship with Jesus, you're not sure that he's changed your life, you want to talk to someone, members of our prayer team are going to be here at the front after the service. They would love to talk with you, pray with you, pray for you. Pastors will be at both the connection centers. We would love for you to come by and just say, hey, let's talk about Jesus. I I, I need to know him or I need to know him more. Because here's what we know. If you follow Jesus, he will surprise you with life. Life beyond your wildest imagination. Because that's why he came, to surprise us in the first place. Let's pray.